Between the myriad of dragons, wizards, bear professors, eldritch horrors, and big titty insect monsters, Magic's legendary creatures are, without a doubt, one of the most compelling and driving parts of the lore, as well as often being some of the most integral parts of the game itself. Be that through win conditions and many of the combo decks of modern, or having the entirety of the commander format built around them. Legendary creatures have also been a key pillar of Magic's visual identity throughout the years, and often the main focus of the game's lore and storytelling, second only to the Planeswalkers that have become the center of most of the game's modern era stories. So what exactly makes something legendary? Legends are, with a few exceptions anyway, creatures, items, or locations that are represented with their own unique name on card. For example, Goblin Wizard from Alpha is not legendary, while Squee the Immortal is. However, the legendary super type didn't exist in Magic's formative years, and this left a few cards in Magic's first two expansions in kind of a weird spot. Creatures like Ali from Cairo or Abu Jafar are clearly named creatures referencing specific people. However, they weren't given the legendary type as it didn't yet exist, and the game's creators decided not to errata these early cards, likely to avoid any confusion amongst players. In June of 1994, Magic's aptly named third expansion, Legends, introduced the Legend Creature type, which would eventually be changed to the Legendary Super type to allow characters to have their own unique creature types while retaining their legendary status. It's worth noting that these were also the game's first creatures that required more than one color of mana to actually cast them. To add to this, the new Legendary type actually came with its own set of rules around them. What would eventually become known as the Legends rule has gone through several changes since. Originally, this rule stated that only one copy of each legendary creature was allowed in your deck, and if your opponent had Ragnar in play, for example, and you played your own, you would have to actually sacrifice your copy immediately. Naturally, this led to several problems later in the game's history, as cards effectively doubling as Nevermores for themselves wasn't really the best look. The plus side to the clunkiness that comes with being a legendary creature was that with time, wizards would be able to actually push those cards harder than they could with normal creatures, without fear of having four of a particularly pushed card in play simultaneously, which could lead to some pretty game-breaking board states. This also matched the flavor of legends and concept and added extra emphasis to their uniqueness in game. The game's first legends were largely not like the creatures we see today. Many of them were actually based off of Richard Garfield and Friends D&D &D characters at the time, or other characters from high fantasy, as well as a few who were just named after real-world historical figures. In addition to the creatures themselves being a bit different, the rate for creatures at the time wasn't nearly what it is today, and paying 5 plus mana for a mediocre vanilla creature was kind of the normal thing back then. And while the majority of cards from this set don't have much history of a competitive play or even lore significance a lot of the time, the set did introduce a handful of notable characters to the game in card form. In addition to the clunky designs of most of these creatures, the lore surrounding them is anywhere from non-existent to only really including what area they're from to not even including what plane they're from. And some of these characters actually have no lore whatsoever, on top of the massive, massive amount of continuity errors from different cycles. It's a lot. There's pre-revisionist timelines and all that. I want to at least touch on most of these characters' lore when possible, so I'll be doing so in a way that, in my opinion anyway, makes the most sense, giving some of the weird inconsistencies with early magic storytelling. To do this, I'll be breaking up the section into mostly consistent, mostly chronological chunks for each card in each story. So the first of these chunks is actually one of the earliest magic stories, chronologically speaking. The Elder Dragon War was, well, is a war between old dragons. These were five of the first eight dragons to spawn from the Ur Dragon, who created all dragons across the multiverse. In this set, we're introduced to Arcades Sabbath, Chromium, Palladium Moors, the Victus Asmati, and Nico Bolas. The latter being the most recognizable and arguably the biggest ongoing antagonist throughout most of the game's storylines. So the war starts with Vivictus Asmati's brood invading Bolas' territory, and Bolas manages to sway the other dragon clans to essentially fight for him. And this sort of goes on for a super long time, like thousands of years long. And towards the end, there's a conflict between Bolas and Arcades, where it seems like Bolas is going to kill Arcades when Bolas' brother Ugin interferes to save Arcades. And this actually pisses Bolas off so bad that his Planeswalker spark ignites, which is this special thing that a few creatures in the entire multiverse are born with that lets them travel between planes of existence. 
Generally, they have to be ignited first, and usually that's from like an intense traumatic event. But Bolas was literally so pissed at his brother that he just phased to another universe. Amazing. Also, as a quick little note that I'm sure most people know, when you hear players call Commander EDH, that's actually an abbreviation for Elder Dragon Highlander, because originally the format was played with these five dragons as commanders. Or that's what people told me 10 years ago when I started playing anyway. I, I don't actually know how the, the true origin of the commander format is like. I know there was some dispute back then as to who even created it. Anyway, a while after this, Bolas engages in the first ever battle between two planeswalkers with an unnamed Leviathan, who he kills and then proceeds to spend an entire year fucking eating. And the remains of the Leviathan that Bolas didn't eat would become to be known as the Talon Gates, which is a kind of important area on Dominaria, I guess. So fast forward a few thousand years or so, a woman named Savitri Scarzan just kind of pops up on an island on Dominaria called Corandor with tons of these like dragon creatures and just starts taking over. Eventually, the people who are native to the island throw together some kind of poison to kill the dragons and she's forced to just kind of leave again. It's not really known if she or her dragons had the ability to planeswalk, but they could kind of planeswalk. So around this time in the same area, there's this guy, Dakon, who was a blacksmith. The planeswalker, Giedron Dihada, comes to him and offers to make him a planeswalker in exchange for making her this super powerful sword, which would eventually become the Black Blade. So this guy, Dakon, spends 10 years straight making this sword, and he literally murders someone with it every time he heats the blade to absorb their energy, and eventually ends up killing his own son with it. Great dad. After all this, Dihada makes him a planeswalker and promptly stabs Dakon's shadow, which absorbs his soul into the blade. This leaves his body alive and binds him to a boy from Karth, which is its own story that we'll save for another day. Anyway, a few years go by and Dihada comes in contact with a nature spirit and just fucks that up to turning him into Sulkinar the Swamp King. She then gives him the Black Blade and eventually has him fight Dacon with it. They fight, Dacon wins, and Dehada summons two elder dragons, one of which being Chromium, who Dacon banishes pretty much immediately and kills the other with Blackblade. If there's a notable drop in quality, I'm really sorry. I just realized my camera can only shoot for about five minutes in 4K. So for the interest in getting this video done in less than a week, um, we're, uh, we're dropping. I don't know anything about cameras, but let's go. So Dacon ends up being manipulated into serving Dihada after this super roundabout ordeal, and they just kind of leave Sulkinar there to vibe in the swamp, where over time he eventually becomes kind of a godlike figure to the natives. So a few years pass, and Sulkinar learns about Savitri Scarzam and thinks, hey, why don't I do that? Why don't I summon the dragons? So he tries to learn how, and is somehow successful in doing so. So he summons the dragons to aid him in invading the land to the north. And in the process, Savitri Scarzan actually comes back with them and she essentially just levels the entire town. And that's the end of that. So now that we're getting into the actual characters from the legend cycle, which is a series of novels, I'm going to try to speed things up just a tad because there's a lot of them. All right, so legend cycle one, there's a group of tiger people called the Ojanin. And there's this one super old tiger man, he's not really old then, but it's a long time ago, who builds the tabernacle at Pendril Vale and eventually finds out that his entire race was essentially just created as a cheap source of slave labor. So naturally, he leads a revolt and defeats this guy, Ur Drago. A while after this, an evil mage named Johan tries to conquer a large area on Jamura which is a continent on Dominaria, has his on Tamar and a group called the Rebarian Mercenaries consisting of Jasmine Boreal and... Hundling Jornerson. I've heard people complain about magic using normal names like Will and Rowan, but holy shit, I prefer that so much to whatever this was. Anyway, the mercenaries, along with the Tiger Man, who has a name, he has, his name is Jaeger, the mercenaries and Jaeger try to stop Johan. Somewhat successfully, although Jaeger O'Janin is eaten by a sandworm in the process. R.I.P. After this, Johan, disguised as a regular dude, um, because Johan looks like this, does some traveling and in the process has a run-in with Jager's son, Jedit, who is searching for his missing father, which Johan naturally lies about. And eventually Jedit finds out the truth and there's a full-on war. Johan ends up killing Hazazan and the war ends with Johan boarding an airship, which Jedit also gets on and tackles Johan off of the side. They both go over into the desert where Johan gets eaten by a fucking sandworm. Love to see it. Y'all could have gotten a little more creative with the deaths in this series. 
After this, with Hazes on Dead, Jeddit becomes the new leader of the Rebaran mercenaries, and that's the gist of the first legend cycle. Other secondary characters from this arc, or at least characters who, from what I've been able to find timeline-wise, were most likely around in the same time period, include Princess Lucrezia, who was a human that ruled over an area of Jamura, whose army kept slaves to build the warships, who were eventually freed by the Rebaran mercenaries. Rasputin Dreamweaver, who killed a bunch of goblins, which indirectly ended the Dark Age on Dominaria. Adden Oakenshield is a character in a book that Johan has the only known copy of, and the book predicts his coming. Not really sure what exactly that means, but that's all we really get. Torwaki. This is one of the many weird continuity errors, and there are actually two characters with the same exact name in the Legend Cycle that are in completely different time periods. In the first cycle, he was an archer who fought against the Rebaran mercenaries, along with Ramirez de Pietro. Ramirez is yet another character with some pretty gnarly continuity errors. He was a pirate around Jamura who supposedly drank from the Fountain of Youth, which is why he looks like a child twink. That's all you really need to know about him. Jax Lever was a former warrior who carried the Sword of the Meek before returning to his homeland in the forest of Pendlehaven. There he lives in peace and just protects the native creatures and wildlife. Gotta love it. Torsten von Ursus was a legendary former knight, and apparently David Attenborough. Um, he spent a bunch of time with the Minotaurs in their homeland and was the first person to discover that they were more than just literally wild animals. He also partially founded and named the nation of Benalia, which is kind of cool. Tobias Andrion was a very famous military advisor from the Shulton Empire, which was the land that would eventually become Benalia after falling. Gwendolyn de Corsi was a famous temptress from the island of Urborg, who during her life lured hundreds, if not thousands of men to the island and then murdered them. Also, fun fact, um, the artist model for the art on the card was actually the vocalist for the Seattle punk band Sick and Wrong, which is cool if you're into that kind of thing. Roga was the leader of the kobolds of Kerkeep. Kobolds were this group of creatures who worshipped a dragon named Prosh, and they believed that if they pillaged enough and generally just went full goblin mode in life, that they would be lucky enough to be reborn as one of Prosh's offspring. Gabriel Angelfire was a warrior angel who came to be worshipped by the Church of Angelfire on Dominaria. Also one of the only male angels in the first two decades of the game or so, which is kind of cool. And now, the legendary creatures from the set who we know very little to absolutely nothing about. Lady Evangela. She likes rainbows. Pavel Maliki. Uh, apparently wandered around and was vaguely helpful. Stang. Absolutely nothing. Bartol Runax. He's a giant from the city of Hammerheim. That's all we get. Axelrod Gunnarsson. Another giant from... Somewhere, I don't know. Sinastian Falconer. Nothing. Lady of the Mountain. Just a spirit, maybe, or something of a lady in the mountain. Gerard of the Closed Fist. From the name, we can assume he was a member of the Order of the Closed Fist, but that's, that's really it. Nebuchadnezzar. Literally just a real-world historical figure. Riven Turnbull. Or the magic equivalent of Edward Snowden. I don't actually know if that's true. Uh, I'm, I'm making that up, but that's that's my headcanon. Livonia Salone. She has a cool name, and that's about it. Rabinia Soulsinger. Once again, nothing. Tuckneer Deathlock, who also has a cool name and may have been a planeswalker. Other than that, not, not much. And lastly, Sir Chandelar of Eberin, who was a knight that fucking died. That's all of his lore. All right, so part two of the legend cycle. Let's wrap this up. So fast forward a ways in the future, there's an emperor ruling large portions of Dominaria called the Nation of Madara. And there's an assassin named Ramses Overdark who is working for the emperor, but only really as a means of furthering his own goals to gain power. And there are these islands just off the coast of Madara called the Ademi Isles, made up of Argenti and Kusho. These isles try to lead an uprising against the emperor's army, who are called the Kensu. Lady Calaria was the ruler of Argenti at the time, and kind of spearheaded the uprising alongside Lord Magnus, Ragnar, Gosta Dirk, and Casimir. 
all of whom were inhabitants of the island. Casimir actually used to be a general in the Kensu, but wanted the title of Imperial Champion, and when he was defeated in battle for the title, he chose to exile himself to Kusho rather than stay there in shame. So Ramses is sent by the emperor to deal with the uprise on the islands, and he sees this as a perfect opportunity to infiltrate the Kensu with some of his own people. And aside from that, Ramses is stoked. He gets this idea to get Madara's current imperial champion, Tetsuo Umezawa, involved in hopes that he'll be killed somehow, that his position can be taken. So Tetsuo, along with Kai Takahashi, Torwaki, not to be confused with the other Torwaki, and Aisha Tanaka head to Kusho. So I mentioned Ramses was trying to replace some of the Kintsu with his own people. He had a few people working for him around this time, including Lady Orca, Zira Arian, the shapeshifter Haftane, and Boris Devilboon, who doesn't really come up a whole lot throughout this story. So Ramses sends Lady Orca there, and she murders Angus Mackenzie at this notoriously peaceful city of Caracas that he led. And honestly, if you've ever played against an Angus Mackenzie deck in Commander, you, you really can't blame her. So on the Isle, Zira manages to infect Kai Takahashi with her brood, which starts turning him into this horrible insect man, which I can only imagine is not very pleasant. So Gosta Dirk, Ragnar, and Casimir are all fighting to defend Kusho, and they're defeated by Tetsuo. Ragnar is eventually killed by the shapeshifter Halfdane, and around this point, Tetsuo and friends realize that Zira has been pitting Kalaria against them. Kalaria then tries to have them arrested, and Zira flees as Tetsuo follows her to try to find a cure for Kai, who at this point is still turning into a horrible fly man and is, is really not doing too hot. So Sierra ends up getting away and Ramsey's overdark summons Lady Orca and orders her to kill Tetsuo, but Tetsuo is able to overpower her pretty easily. So after this first siege, the Emperor is pretty upset with overdark for not really delivering on that promise to stop the uprising. So he sends another wave of the Kintsu to try again, this time led by <laughs> Barktooth Warbeard, which is just a name, <laughs> and Morhart Els Dragon, which is somehow less impressive. Um, the former of whom would be killed and replaced with the shapeshifter Halfdane. That's kind of a recurring theme in the story. Um, so Halfdane ends up killing Kai as well. And around this point, Tetsuo is just completely disgusted with Ramses and really the entire empire in general for everything that's been going on. And just the kind of fucked up links that the empire takes to achieve power. Internally, he's kind of always felt this, but can never really speak out because of his title. And at this point, he ends up just renouncing his title. So naturally, when Ramsey's Overdark hears about this, he's super happy as that's just one less thing for him to worry about. And he sets out to overthrow the Emperor himself. Um, fast forward a little while, he finds out has actually been the Dragon Planeswalker Nico Bolas the entire time and just realizes there's absolutely no way to achieve that. But Bolas ends up being kind of chill about everything and makes Ramsey's his regent anyway. Meanwhile, Aisha Tanaka has actually been sucked inside of the Sylvan Library by Lord Magnus, who, as a side note, killed the invading Kensu by animating the leather on their armor and killing them with it, which is without a doubt the most badass part of this entire story. So the Kensu have all either been driven out or killed, and Magnus eventually lets Aisha go and just tells her to just get the fuck out of here. Tetsuo ends up killing Sira. Aisha and Tor fight with Halfdane, who at this point is just shapeshifting into everyone. Um, and Tor ends up killing him. Tetsuo eventually ends up confronting Overdark. They have it out, and Tetsuo eventually kills Overdark. And Bolas is not super stoked about that. So naturally, Tetsuo flees to the meditation plane, and Bolas follows him there. They fight for a while, and Tetsuo actually manages to kill Bolas. Bolas, kind of, but not really. So after this, Tetsuo is really the only original remaining member of the Empire, along with Aisha and Tor, and everyone tries to push him to take on the role of the new Emperor. Um, and that's pretty much the end of um, the second Legends storyline. It's really not sure if he actually accepts the role. I read in one article online that he did, but from what I remember reading in the book, it's not really clear. Not that it matters too much. So while Legends was far from a perfect set, it succeeded in laying the groundwork for later sets to expand on the design space, both of legendary and multicolored permanents. And despite the stories being overall a little convoluted at times, the early novels really aren't bad considering Magic was just a new card game and didn't have the massive dedicated community around the lore like it does today. 
So with that being said, I do plan on going set by set chronologically from this point forward and analyzing all of the legends in the game in this way, both in terms of their historical in-game significance with competitive and casual play, as well as summarizing the lore around these characters and their overarching stories. I really hope you guys enjoy these videos because I had a ton of fun putting this together. Thanks so much for watching. As always, it means a lot. If you want to see more stuff like this, leave me a comment, like, subscribe, do all the YouTube stuff. I don't, I don't know how to end videos. <laughs>